I like that board that yours is on. That looks like it's an old cutting board that a bear got a hold of about 40 <laughs> years ago. Oh no, nothing, nothing like tail like that. It was, it was a fence board from um, mm -hmm. the pea patch that I was at. So I like the idea of kind of repurposing something. And yeah. um, the friend of mine, who's the woodworker, she had cut that down because she also loved the knot holes in it. And so she kept that piece specifically for the, there's a second knot hole that's kind of hidden. Yeah. Great. Uh -huh. And um, there's, there's a second announcement today. Roxy Power is going to give us a preview of what can be heard 8 p.m. Pacific Daylight Time tonight on streaming radio, yes? Yeah, yeah, I just put it in the uh, chat. Paul was um, incredibly eloquent, as you can imagine, interviewee. Um, didn't make one mistake. It was as though he had a script. It was as though his Ikebana flew from his mind, fully formed in words about his poetic life and projective ways and his ancestral influences from Michael McClure to you, Andrew, and everyone in between. So there's an interview I did for the Hive Poetry Collective that can be heard at KSQD 90.7 FM tonight at um, 8 p.m. Just go to the upper left corner and hit live stream or I put the uh, link to the Spotify, the evil Spotify, <clears throat> or anywhere you get your podcast. Go to Apple. It'll be there at least on Spotify by 10 p.m. tonight. Okay. So it's going to be live tonight or is it going to be? It's a live, live stream. Tonight? So it'll seem, in other words, uh, tonight's the radio show. We have a regularly ske scheduled Sunday night, 8 p.m., show for the Hive Poetry Collective, who also puts on poetry events in Santa Cruz. Mm -hmm. All of us are podcasters as well. Mm -hmm. I radio see. folks. But the big All radio right. folk is, uh, oh, sorry. Uh, wait, wait, cut, cut, bum, do it. Uh, Paul, who's been doing what? this for so many years that uh, uh, I'm an apprentice to him, really. I just started doing this last year. Excellent. Thanks, Roxy. I, I appreciate all the, the trouble you went to uh, prepare for it. Oh, no, it's, it's great. It's his new day song, um, Day Song Miracle, Past 62, and a really long, involved conversation about long-form poetry that I think, you know, and even Paul's what I conceived of as his ideograms. Um, so I brought you in there in our pound class shelling if you want to listen long enough to find yourself, as well as Matt Trees' beautiful introduction to Pig War. So I got the noetic knots in there a little bit, Matt. So much I didn't get in, you know, about Paul's long books, but um, we tried. Thanks, Roxy. It was, it was a real honor to be interviewed by you, and I appreciate the sacred nature with which you prepared for it, and that doesn't happen very often. Thank you for interviewing me, Paul. I enjoyed interviewing you. Mapes Creek is a little creek running by our house here, uh, and uh, we're doing a blessing on the 27th. Well, we're spending a thousand dollars to fly into Seattle and being a part of if you don't live in the greater Puget Sound region. Um, and uh, the Lashute Seed word, Nook Wook Web, is what we have up there. And we have several speakers, including those from the Soto Zen tradition, a Wiccan priestess, a couple people from Serve Ethiopians, Washington, and a fish biologist originally from Philadelphia, who is very involved in sprucing up the park. And they had the grand reopening yesterday from noon to four. So Veronica Martinez and I were staffing the table. In fact, this, I could, and Zach Charles also, your, your postcard, poetry postcard friend. So that's a lot of announcements. Um, 308, we killed eight minutes already, Andrew, and all the rest are up to you. Well, actually, there's two more announcements. Okay, good. First of all, I'm going to be um, on the San Juan Ridge in California giving a poetry reading next Sunday. So, um, we're going to delay um, this. We, we'll, we'll skip a week and add a week. So we'll have two more meetings, which will be April 28th and May 5th. And we're going to skip next week, which is April 21st. Um, yeah, so I'll be up uh, reading with a few of the old time bioregion places, uh, people, you know, Northern California and that sort of thing. If any of you know Jim Dodge or Jerry Martian, uh, uh, several other people. Um, uh, so anyhow, um, let's see. And let's see, same weight where you before 28 
and May and Ka no, we'll we'll have class here, you know, on Zoom on May twenty eighth. I'm sorry, on April twenty eighth and May fifth. April twenty eighth and May fifth. So we'll we'll skip next week. Okay. Where's the San Juan Ridge? What's <clears throat> it's um it's uh you know it's it's in the foothills of the Sierras above Nevada City, but it's a oh. place that's been um a center for poets a long time. It's where Gary Snyder sort of convened a community long time. Allen Ginsberg had a place up there. It's where Lou Welch disappeared. Um Susan Got Suntree it. lived up there, Steve Sandfield. And I also want to just as my other announcement say that today, April 14th, um, is the birthday of one of the other great writers from up there, Dale Pendle. So um keep keep in mind Dale Pendle today, uh, that real coyote of uh American letters and psychedelics and uh plant allies really would be the term he'd use and theogens but plant allies and uh you know he's one of the people who did all the hard work which is sort of laying down roots now with the possibility of psychedelics being authorized for various purposes unfortunately so far not much for recreation so-called recreation as though that's what it is it's not recreation it's spiritual exploration but um you know the uh the world is changing in some ways interestingly um good so let's see um i think that's all the announcements unless anybody else has anything they want to weigh in with um good. um I just wanted to mention that I had I sent Paul because I didn't have your email, Andrew, a uh, link to um, some music that Pound refers to, and I and there was an actual playing of it, so I didn't want didn't want to forget that. Yeah, I heard that. Thank you so much. You know, it's actually Pound reading the lines yes, around the music, yeah. and uh, we'll look at that briefly today. And thank you. That was very helpful um little account um you know being able to see where that second of the Bison cantos came from uh before we get going any um overarching comments or questions anybody wants to make about the Bison cantos and where we are heading now with them um uh i guess maybe then what i will do i as as I have often done, I like to read in a little bit of a circle or, you know, that wonderful word that Sally just used, repurpose. So I want to repurpose an earlier canto now. Um, so I wonder, Paul, if, um, if, if you want, we could put up, it's just a two-page canto. It's on page 244, and it's canto 49, which we spent, a, you know, a certain amount of time looking at several weeks ago, um, but I think worth going back to as a way of getting a running leap into where we are with the peace on cantos and uh, some sort of real contrast with what's going on in the peace on cantos. This you'll probably remember as soon as you see it as a canto that because of the opening phrase has been named by scholars the Seven Lakes Canto. And a uh, little bit of just quick background on it, which is that this canto is based on four old anonymous Chinese poems, which have traditional translations into Japanese. And it's believed that Pound first saw these poems when he was quite young. His parents had a volume um, of these eight poems, and the eight poems really go specifically with sites um, along the Xiang River and may have been originally part of one of those landscape scrolls that unfold. So uh, um, in an interesting way, uh, back, let's say, half a generation before Gary Snyder was born and undertook his, or I'm sorry, no, a few years after Gary Snyder was born, 
um, who you know named his long Poundian poem "Mountains and Rivers Without End" after a particular Chinese landscape scroll that had various poems and signatures on it. Ezra Pound was already doing this. Um, so eight poems, though you could say eight um, Chinese poems, which were then available also in Japanese translations. And Pound did not take the eight poems either in order or um, keeping the integrity of the poems. So a lot of the pieces of this canto is built up out of several of these poems. And there's no, um, when you see the stanza breaks, that does not mean one Chinese original and then another Chinese original, but several of these may have two or three poems or lines from poems and pounds translation in it. He knew these from this book in his father's and mother's house. Uh, he also knew one of the poems from the manuscripts he got from Ernest Fenelosa, and there may have been other places that he could have gathered this material out of various libraries. But one of the reasons I want to look at this is, aside from six lines that Pound interpolates, which should all be largely recognizable, really, no, I'm sorry, only four lines he interpolates that should be recognizable as either lines or riffs on lines that he's brought up before in the cantos. This entire canto is built out of books, built out of other books. So I want to just go through it and we can listen to it. These are, um, if you see the opening line for the seven lakes, and the seven lakes refer to a particular area of central China that the Xiang River runs through. And it was, um, you know, a little bit like saying uh, the Lake District in England, or, um, uh, you know, calling Minnesota the, the land of lakes. Um, this was a known district called the Seven Lakes. It's not seven poems, it's eight poems. And because they are, they don't come down to us with any attribution, they're considered anonymous. And some of them may have been folk songs, but the opening line then for the Seven Lakes refers to the district that these poems emerge from, <clears throat> and the second half of that open line, and by no man these verses, is um, not only an interesting way of saying anonymous poems, but very chillingly, if we point forward to what we looked at last week in the cantos, Ezra Pound calling himself by Odysseus's term, oite, no man no man, I am no man, which is what he'd come to feel in the tiger cage at Pisa. This, however, is um, a number of years before Pisa. And, you know, if anybody wonders about prophecy in poetry or the predictive nature of poetry, this would be an interesting one to dig into. And we've seen um, no man show up earlier in the cantos, but not with the poignancy that no man or oite shows up once Pound ends up in the cage at Pisa. So all that said, I'm going to um, give a read through this. For the seven lakes and by no man, these verses, rain, empty river, a voyage, fire from frozen cloud, Heavy rain in the twilight. Under the cabin roof was one lantern. The reeds are heavy, bent, and the bamboos speak as if weeping. Autumn moon, hills rise about lakes against sunset. Evening is like a curtain of cloud, a blur above ripples, and through it sharp long spikes of the cinnamon a cold tune amid reeds. Behind hill, the monk's bell, born on the wind. Sail past here in April, may return in October. 
boat fades in silver. Slowly, sun blaze alone on the river. Where wine flag catches the sunset, sparse chimneys smoke in the crosslight. Comes then snow scur on the river, and a world is covered with jade. Small boat floats like a lanthorn, the flowing water clots as with cold. And at San Yin, they are a people of leisure. While geese swoop to the sandbar, clouds gather about the hole of the window. Broad water, geese line out with the autumn, rooks clatter over the fishermen's lanterns. A light moves on the north skyline where the young boys prod stones for shrimp. And 1700 came sing to these hill lakes. A light moves on the south skyline. State by creating riches should thereby get into debt. This is infamy. This is Geryon. This canal goes still to Ten Shi, though the old king built it for pleasure. K men ran ke, kyo man man ke, jitsu getsu ko gua tan fuku tan gai. Sun up, work. Sun down, to rest. Dig well and drink of the water. Dig field, eat of the grain. Imperial power is, and to us, what is it? The fourth, the dimension of stillness and the power over wild beasts. Let's come back to full screen, Paul, for a moment. Um, so what I want to just think about with that poem for a moment is that, that is a poem built out of other poems almost entirely. And while Chinese scholars can go into it and show all sorts of mistakes that Ezra Pound made, including um, uh, making what he calls San Yin as a place name. San Yin actually means something like the South Wind. Um, he's mixed up lines from different poems, but he's built this entirely out of lines of poetry with the exception of those four lines, the first one, state by creating riches, should thereby get into debt. This is infamy. This is Garyon. And then at the end, we've seen before the fourth, the dimension of stillness and the power over wild beasts. We know from earlier in the cantos that the power over wild beasts comes from Dionysus, who is also Adonis. And we've had, since Canto II, the wild beasts appearing regularly um, in the poem. Um, so in some senses, these four lines, even that Ezra Pound has interpolated into the Chinese poems, are really lifted out of earlier cantos. A visitor asked Pound about this canto, and he said he considered it to be a glimpse of paradise. Okay, this is Canto 49. Um, if Pound was going to keep with his hundred cantos that he believed he was writing, this would be about halfway. Um, so a nice place to get a first glimpse of paradise. Um, it's interesting to think that his glimpse of paradise is, first of all, built out of old books, second of all, um, uh, filled with a kind of agricultural um, utopia or pastoral utopia. Um, third of all, it's built up out of Chinese poetry, which I think he saw often as uh, a refreshing contrast with Western poetics. Um, but if he was going to keep to his plan uh, and, let's say, build a 
commedia out of a hundred cantos, he would have to start by around 66, 67, 68, writing Paradise. And writing Paradise is what he was hoping to do with his poem, following the Dante model, 33 or really 34 cantos of hell, another 33 of purgatory, and then at 67 or 68, moving into paradise. So I think now we can move forward to Canto 74, which is the Pisan Cantos. And yeah, Roxy, let me uh, interrupt. Boy, that, yeah. I, I really didn't want to interrupt you. Um, but at some point, maybe not now, um, I would love to know if you know other people since Pound who have interpolated him. Um, I'm interested in doing a, I don't know, um, probably tertiary interpolation myself of this particular poem because our family paradise in Wyoming was known as Seven Lakes. We had to winch ourselves oh. up there because there was no road to it. And as soon as I saw a line opening with Seven Lakes, and I'm in the middle of a book that I'm trying to write now, trying to find the right place, a book that includes rivers. So I'll go back to Snyder, Mountains and Rivers Without End. But if there are people who have done this well, because I'm sure that we've all piggybacked, or many people have piggybacked, probably including yourself on Pound. And I'm interested in finding how to, like Yertle the Turtle and Dr. Seuss piggyback all these turtles on top of each other. Um, without falling into the river, so to speak. So that can be another conversation, another time, if any of that made sense. Yeah, it did. I mean, you know, there there have been people who um, really know Chinese culture who have written on this particular canto. And um, you can find that in the uh, Carol Terrell, uh, what's it called, the Guide to the Cantos. If you look at Canto 49, he'll give you several references. Um, yeah, there's a, uh, it's being held up, the Carol Terrell, a companion to the Cantos of Edward Pound, and that will give you some references which will take you to various Pound scholars, including one of my favorites, a character who was at Harvard named Achilles Fong, F-A-N-G, um, who, you know, uh, if you almost couldn't have a better name for somebody who was going to write on the Cantos than Achilles Fong. Um, you know, that Homeric first name and the Chinese surname. Um, but then there have been other people who've written, you know, poems on rivers and particularly, I think, of Lewis McAdams in Los Angeles, who wrote a three-volume book on the Los Angeles River and, you know, the sort of fate of it. And I mentioned a few moments ago from San Juan Ridge, Susan Suntree, who's lived a long time in, San, in Los Angeles, has been doing a lot of digging into Los Angeles as a place and not only writing poems, but doing performances. And I bet there's YouTubes of her, um, you know, working on the Los Angeles River and various other aspects of things down down Los Angeles region. Paul, I see you got a hand up. I think Roxy had one more. Roxy, did you get your question answered? Oh. Yeah, thank you. Sorry, I'll re remove my hand. Well, you, you said that um, he, he went to the Chinese as a sort of uh, reaction to the poetry of his day. And we're talking about romantic poetry by and large, which when, when uh, certainly when he was writing in 1912, that was pretty much what we've had. So can you uh, elaborate a little bit on what he was some of the excesses of romanticism and and uh, what he was responding to, what he didn't care for in that. Well, that would you know that would take you back to his book Cafe, published during World War One, and I think all the way back to that point, he was seeing Chinese poetry and to some extent maybe Chinese culture as um, having some pointers to break the hubris of Western civilization. I think it was less romantic poetry he was opposed to than the kind of clotted, um, you know, when he was when he was in England, you know, think of who the, you know, the, the when he first got to England in 
1908, 1909, for the first five years, who would have been the major poets? Alfred Lord Tennyson, William Morris, Dante Gabriel Rossetti, Algernon Charles Swinburne. I mean, all of these people whose poetry was locked in the past and was so far removed from colloquial common speech and so far removed from the sense of I'm a human being and I can sit down and talk to another human being through my poetry. And it would lead Ed Sanders and the Fugs to do something like the Swinburne Stomp. <laughs> yes, yes. And, and that's not to malign any of those people, but it is to say that Pound was really trying to find his way forward. Um, and, and I think the Chinese poetry gave a clarity and a permission to, um, you know, as he would say, the natural object is always the adequate symbol. You don't need roses and goblets and Arthurian swords and unicorns. You can speak about what's in front of you, um, you know, to get get across what you want. And so the natural symbol, I mean, natural object is always the adequate symbol. Declot the poem. And then he was also doing another interesting dance, which is, you know, we read last week that spooky solo canto in which Marinetti shows up and wants Pound's body, and then somebody grabs Pound's wrist, and you know, a disembodied hand grabs his wrist and pins him to the wall. But at one point, he's saying to Marinetti, You wanted the future too much, I wanted the past. I just read an interesting little anecdote that the Vorticists, Pound's friends, Wyndham Lewis and Godier Breshka and Pound's wife, Dorothy, all went to hear Marinetti speak. And they thought he was a goofball, you know, and, and their response was basically, well, you guys in Italy, you know, you're coming out of the medieval era. You think machines are a big deal. We've had machines for a hundred years in England and believe us, me, they're not saviors and they're not a big deal. They're just what we live with every day. We've got motor buses and steamships and, you know, Blake satanic mills. And so they thought Marinetti was just in some kind of paradisal cloud land uh, you know, seeing the machines as our model for poetry. So I think in a way, when Pound dives into the Chinese model there, it, you know, and it also fits well into his economics, the um, miracle of natural increase. The earth just has goods that it provides us, as opposed to what he calls usury or garyon, which is to say, the flow of goods, the flow of wealth gets appropriated or stopped by various powers. So I think that's, you know, it 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 fits well into his model, the celebration of a kind of simplicity. Um, and, you know, and then add into that when Cathay came out, there was probably no doubt in the basic European mind that Europe was the pinnacle of civilization. And for Pound to, you know, throw in from left field this set of poems that, you know, were in a way better than anything coming out of the English speaking world, it would have really had to have changed that hubris which is already being changed by the fact of World War One, and here was the greatest pinnacle of civilization, and people were using their machinery to rip one another apart. But well, why don't we go to where we left off last week in Canto seventy four? So if we can right, go, and, Andrew, can I ask you one more thing? Sorry, um, yeah. I, I was trying to, I was racking my brain as you were talking because I went to Cornell through an MFA program with one Timothy Billings who wrote on Ezra Pound's Cafe and Chinese poetry. Are you familiar with his work? I think he might be someone along with those folks that you mentioned, but I'll, I'll put his name in the. I think I think yeah. I know some of his work on Cafe. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. All right. Great. So why don't we go um, 
uh, Paul, maybe to page 435, right more or less to where we left off um, in the cantos. And as you scroll for a few pages here, everybody look to at the sort of newfound um, uh, layout on the page of the canto here. Um, so page 455, Paul, which I think will go on a few pages on. Yeah, about 10 pages on. Yeah, one back, yeah, one back, 455 there, great. And we're just gonna pick up right in the middle and work our way through this canto and I'll stop to gloss things a little bit. Each one is God's name. As by Terracina rose from the seas, Zephyr behind her and from her manner of walking as had Anchises till the shrine be again white with marble, till the stone eyes look again seaward. That's actually about a statue of Athena that had impressed pound. Um, the stone eyes look again seaward. So he's continuing to build his sort of personal mythology and religion out of um, the old Greek mysteries and the Chinese, and we immediately move into that uh, anecdote that came up in Canto 2. The wind is part of the process. The rain is part of the process. The process here being the Chinese Tao. And the Pleiades sat in her mirror, Greece, Guanon, the stone bringeth sleep, China and Japan. So again, we've got Greek and Chinese just right next to each other. The Pleiades set in her mirror, Quanon, the stone bringeth sleep, offered the wine bowl, grass nowhere out of place, nether earth, mother, that's Thonia, Gea, Matre, mother by thy herbs, menth, thyme, and basilicum, from whom and to whom will never be more now than at present being given a new green cake he did of a Sunday, emerald, paler than emerald, minus its right propeller. Just stop there a moment. Um, what are these lines? Being given a new green cake he did of a Sunday, emerald, paler than emerald, minus its right propeller. Remember, Pound's in this cage and nobody's allowed to talk to him really. And He's already seen um, a couple of little mites, including that lion colored pup bringing fleas. I think he's suddenly at a place where the power over wild beasts has real meaning to him. This is a little Katie did that must have landed in his cage or on his page or on his knee or on his forearm. And the way he beams down to look at this, I don't think there's any place except possibly a few of the descriptions of Southern France when Pound walked through. I don't think there's any place where he looks with such clarity and minute particular. And the gift he gets here is from, well, he's named her Matra, mother, and we've had the Pleiades and Quanon. So all of a sudden there are these um, sort of mother goddesses appear because there's nowhere else he'd be given a new green Katie did. Being given a new green Katie did of a Sunday. Emerald, paler than emerald, minus its right propeller. This tent is to me Antithonus, eater of great pulp, in coitu illuminatio, that's his um, sort of phrasing what he thinks the Eleusinian mysteries were about, the, illu the illumination, the luminosity, the light of coitus, eater of great pulp and coitu illuminatio. Manet painted the bar at La Cigale, or at Les Folies in that year, 
She did her hair in small ringlets, a la 1880 it might have been. This is usually glossed as being a remembrance of his girlfriend, Olga Rudge. Red and the dress she wore, Drake Cole or Lanvin, a great goddess. Aeneas knew her forthwith by paint immortal as no other age is immortal. La France dix neuvième Degas Manet Guy's unforgettable, a great brute sweating paint, said Vanderpil 40 years later of La Manque. Notice, you know, just the memory here, just the names he's beginning to invoke of previous artists and the memories of Paris where he first met Olga Rudge and how she did her hair and all this coming right after the little Katie did that has landed and given him a power over wild beasts and brought him to that phrase in quitu in lumine, in numina, in, in luminatio. For this stone giveth sleep, stari ascenza piu scose, it would rest without further tossing. This is his state of mind with the um, insomnia he's suffering from, the pain in his eyes, and he's thinking of that stone, that sapphire, that blue sapphire. For this stone giveth sleep, stari ascenza say, and eucalyptus, that is for memory, under the olives, by Cyprus. You remember I told you when he was taken at gunpoint out of his little cottage in the hills of Italy, under arrest, he stooped and picked up a eucalyptus bud under the olive trees and walked down the Salida and effectively disappeared from his previous life and disappeared from his family, his friends, for everybody. So just think about the state of mind and yet the kind of language he's using. For the stone give us sleep. Staria sends a pius cose. It would rest without further tossing. And eucalyptus, that is for memory. I have this kind of, you know, sort of feeling when I see that line that Pound is so lost from his previous world, it's as though the eucalyptus is a talisman. It's all he holds of his former life. Remember, he's now 60 years old, incommunicado, under arrest at Pisa, watching his cellmates be taken out and executed. He doesn't know where he is. He doesn't know who he is. He's just oitie, no man, no man. And he must be clutching this little eucalyptus bud and eucalyptus that is for memory under the olives by Cyprus, Mare Tireno. Past Mel Maison and Field by the river, the tables, Sidar, Armenonville, and again, he's thinking back now to his wanderings in southern France, or at Ventador, the keys of the chateau, rain, Ussel, to the left of La Bella Torre, the tower of Ugolino, in the tower, to the left of the tower, chewed his son's head. Ugolino is a figure who shows up in Dante's inferno chewing his son's head for various infractions he had made on earth um, and the only people who did anything of interest were h m and frobenius der geheimrat der im baluba das gewitter gemacht hat frobenius being a uh, anthropologist that he was very interested in the theories of who did work in Africa and Australia. And he's thinking about in Baluba in Africa. Um, and Monsieur Jean wrote a play now and then, 
or the possum. So think about this now. He's He's gone into the roads of southern France. He's seen the tower in which Ugolino reputedly had chewed his son's head. And Dante had condemned him to the inferno that way. And then he suddenly comes back out into something in the present. And the only people who did anything of interest were H.M. and Frobenius der Geheimrat. And Monsieur Jean, who I think is Cocteau, wrote a play now and then for the possum, T.S. Eliot. Couvrette et ancienne, onc letters, ne luce. And then I think this comes now to be the heart of the whole book, really. I don't know how humanity stands it with a painted paradise at the end of it without a painted paradise at the end of it. Just look at those two lines, or really the three lines. He's well aware that by now he should be writing paradise and he's on death row locked in a cage. I don't know how humanity stands it with a painted paradise at the end of it without a painted paradise at the end of it. And then he dives back into the grass. The dwarf morning glory twines around the glass, grass blade. Magna nox animae, the great night of the soul. Magna nox animae, with Barabbas and two thieves beside me. The wards like a slave ship. Remember, almost all the inmates and the detention camp are black. And he looks out and thinks the wards like a slave ship. Mr. Edwards, Hudson, Henry, Comes, Misere, which is companions of misery. Comites, Cairns, Green, Tom Wilson, God's messenger, Whiteside. And the guard's opinion of the was lower than that of the prisoners. All of them goddamn motherfucking generals, cocksuckers, all of them fascists, or a bag of dukes. The things I say and do, ac ego in haram, and I too in the pigsty, so lay men in Circe's swine sty, evi in haram ego, Ac vidi cadaveris animae. Come on, small fry, said the little coon to the big black of the slavers seen between decks. And all the presidents, Washington, Adams, Monroe, Pope, Tyler, plus Carroll of Carrollton, Crawford, robbing the public for private individuals' gain. Their lion. That feline means to bewitch or to enchant or to dupe or to robbing the public for private individuals' gain. Every bank of discount is downright iniquity, robbing the public for private individuals' gain. Nec bene comata circe ma caca. I can't read this, but it means um, she gave them dreadful drugs. This is Circe giving them dreadful drugs. Neither with lions nor leopards attended, but poison, veneno, and all the veins of the common wheel, if on high, will flow downward all through them. If on the four did Pradapio settled upward, not the priest, but the victim. His seal, Satalkas, said the old combatant victim, withstood them by Thames and by Niger, with pistol by Niger, with a printing press by the Thames bank, until I end my song and shot himself for praise of Intaglios. Matteo and Pisanello out of Babylon, they are left us for roll or plain impact or cut square in the jade block. Nox animi magna, 
again, great night of the soul, Nox Animae Magna from the tent under Taishan, amid what was termed the asshole of the army, the guards holding opinion. As a word, a dream of mortician's daughters rattled but amorous to study with the white wings of time passing. Is not that our delight? To have friends come from far countries is not that pleasure, nor to care that we are untrumpeted. Filial, fraternal affection is the root of humaneness, the root of the process. This is all now straight out of Confu Confucius. Whether he's translating out of his little volume of Confucius or just remember, remembering Confucius. Others have translated this, these passages different ways, but Pound is reading the ideograms and he sees that there are white wings on the ideogram for time and he creates this line to study with the white wings of time passing. Is not that our delight? To have friends come from far countries, is not that pleasure? Who would care that we are untrumpeted? Filial, fraternal affection is the root of humaneness, the root of the process, the root of the Tao. Nor our elaborate speeches and slick alacrity employ men in proper season, not when they are at harvest. E altriedro cunitza e l'altra io son la luna. Dry, friable earth going from dust to more dust. Grass worn from its root hold. Is it blacker? Was it blacker? Nox anime. Is there a blacker? Or was it merely San Juan with a bellyache riding ad posteros? In short, shall we look for a deeper, or is this the bottom? Let's just hold there for a moment and think of the movement we just had from the citation of Confucius. And we ended with, you know, for, well, we began the Confucius little passage with studying with the white wings of time passing, the delight, friends visiting from afar. Um, and then moving into employing men in proper season at the top of this page, not when they are at harvest. And then yo son la luna, I am the moon. And then suddenly he looks back down, I think at the earth at his feet, dry friable earth going from dust to more dust, grass worn from its root hold. Is it blacker? Was it blacker? Nox animai, that great night of the soul is the famous phrase from St. John. The St. John who wrote the you know, dark night of the soul, the dark night, the black night of the soul, the Spanish mystic. Nox animai, night of the soul. Is there a blacker or was it merely San Juan with a bellyache writing ad posteros? In short, shall we look for a deeper, or is this the bottom? Again, a clue to what must be Pound's state of mind. Shall we look for a deeper, or is this the bottom? And then he goes back to Ugolino, the tower there on the tree line. Berlin, dysentery, phosphorus, La Vie de Candida, Helen Corporal Casey, Double X for bureaucracy, Le Paradis n'est pas artificiel. Any of you recognize that from Baudelaire? Le Paradis n'est pas, pas artificiel. Paradise is not artificial but spezzato apparently. Spezzato means broken or fragmented or splintered or scattered. Paradise, nay, 
pas artificial. It's not artificial, but it's splintered, apparently. It exists only in fragments. Unexpected, excellent sausage. The smell of mint, for example. Ladro the night cat. Notice how the cat has reappeared here with the thought of paradise. But I think this is, you know, in a way, if if that Seven Lakes Canto was a glimpse of paradise, and we know that it's built up out of fragments of the Chinese and the Japanese, this is remarkable that he's holding on to that sense of things. Paradise, le paradis ne pas artificial, but spetsato apparently. It exists only in fragments. Unexpected excellent sausage. What is that? I don't know. Is that a meal he's been delivered in the, in the camp? Good Italian sausage? The smell of mint, for example? I mean, this is where he is now. Is paradise may be only fragments, and it may simply be that smell of mint under the tent flaps that he mentioned earlier. Or Ladro the night cat, the cat that comes visiting. Et Nemi waited on the slope above the lake, sunken in the pocket of hills, awaiting decision from the old lunch cabin built out over the shingle. Zarathustra now desuete, obsolete. Zarathustra now obsolete to Juniper and to Hermes, where now is the Casalaro. No vestige save in the air. In stone is no imprint in the gray walls of no era. Under the olives, seculorum, Athenae, and then this glaucos glauconos in the Greek is a pun that has troubled scholars for a long, long time. One of them means she of gray eyes, and that was an epithet for Athena, and the other means owl, and so the owl has always been seen as the bird of Athena, but nobody knows quite what the connection is between Athena, who is described in Homer as having gray eyes, and the owl, but old statues of Athena have the owl as Athena's mount in the way that bodhisattvas in Buddhism have mounts, or the gods of Hinduism have mounts. So we've got the owl, the gray-eyed one, Olivi, that which gleams and then does not gleam as the leaf turns in the air. Have we talked about the olive leaves, how one side is green and one gray, and when they turn in the air, you can see gray and then green? And I think this is um, now Pound's view of what paradise might be that which gleams and then does not gleam as the leaf turns in the air. I think this is sort of remarkable here because previously Pound was trying to write paradise. Great active confidence, hubris maybe, and here he's given it up and he realizes the paradise is absolutely out of his control. Paradise probably exists. It's not artificial, but it's splintered. It's scattered. It's that which gleams and then does not gleam as the leaf turns in the air. And you can see under the olives where Athena is, the owl, the gray-eyed Athena, Olivi, that which gleams and then does not gleam as the leaf turns in the air. Boreas, Apiliota, Libetio. Boreas and Apiliota are, of course, the names of these classical winds in the Mediterranean. Che il babbo, said the young mother. That's the big bear. And the bathers, like small birds under hawk's eye, shrank back under the cliff's edge at Il Pozzetto Articulio. 
would, said the guard, take every one of them goddamn motherfucking generals, cocksuckers, all of them fascists. Notice how in the midst of his view of what paradise is, Pound suddenly can pull in just the string of, you know, the guards talking, talking about the generals, strings of obscenities, strings of just ordinary colloquial talk. There's a there's a mix of language here that I think Pound had been working towards, but might have always been interfered with because he had too many books around. And now he's just got his thoughts and his ears and his eyes. Oedipus, nepotes, reme, magnanimi. So Mr. Bullington lay on his back like an ape, singing, Oh, sweet and lovely, oh, lady, be good. In harum ac ego evi, I also entered the pigsty. In harum ac ego evi, criminals have no intellectual interests. And for three months did not know the taste of his food. In Chi heard Shun's music, a sharp song with sun under its radiance. And then the Greek means clear or shrill, the sharp song, the clear song with sun under its radiance. One tanka, that's a Japanese um, poetry form, one tanka entitled the shadow, a bow or the hawk's wing of no fortune and with a name to come that echo out of canto number one, where Elpenor is a man of no fortune and with a name to come. So back to Odysseus and then quick forward is downright iniquity, said Jay Adams at 35 instead of 21.65, doubtless conditioned by what his father heard in Byzantium, doubtless conditioned by the spawn of that great Meyer Anselm, that old H had heard from the ass-eared militarists in Byzantium. Why stop to begin again when we are stronger? And young H, the tip from the Augean stables in Paris with CF in attendance, or not as the case may have been, thus conditioning, Meyer Anselm, a romance, yes, yes, certainly, but more fool if you few if you fall for it two centuries later. From their seats, the blonde bastards who cast them. The yid is a stimulant, and the goyim are cattle in great proportion, and go to saleable slaughter with a maximum of docility. But if the place be fair saltsen, spoiled or Oversalted, literally oversalted. A place be fair salts and oversalted with justice by the law, from the law, or it is not in the contract. You has nothing pinned on Jehovah, sent and named Shun, who to the autumnal heavens, Sha'o, with the sun under its melody, to the compassionate heavens. And there is also the 19th Leviticus. Thou shalt purchase the field with money, signed Jeremiah from the tower of Hananel unto Goa, unto the horse gate 850 and Anatoth, which is in Benjamin 867, for the purity of the air on Chokorua in a land of maple, from the law, by the law, so build your temple with justice and meat yard and measure. A black delicate hand, a white's hand like a ham passed by, seen under the tent flap. On sick call, command, command, sick call, command. And the two largest rackets are the alternation of the value of money of the unit of money, metathemenon teton krumenon. That means the uh, metathemenon, the alternation of money. So the two largest rackets are changing the value of money 
and usury, at 60 or lending that which is made out of nothing. And the state can lend money, as was done by Athens for the building of the Salamis fleet. And if the packet gets lost in transit, ask Churchill's backers where it has got to. The state need not borrow, nor do the veterans need state guarantees for private usurious lending. In fact, that is the cat in the woodshed. The state need not borrow. As was shown by the mayor of Vurgel, who had a milk route, and whose wife sold shirts and short breeches, and on whose bookshelf was the life of Henry Ford, and also a copy of the Divina Commedia and of the Yedichte, of the poetry of Heine, a nice little town in the Tyrol, in a wide, flat-lying valley near Innsbruck. And when a note of the small town of Vurgo went over a counter in Innsbruck, and the banker saw it go over, all the slobs in Europe were terrified. No one, said the Frau Burgomeister, in this village who could write a newspaper article, who knew it was money but pretended it was not in order to be on the safe side of the law. So this is the story of the mayor who does an, uh, you know, uh, uh, an experiment with so-called vegetable money issuing bills that are dated. And every month you have to, um, for 10%, buy a stamp to put on the bill uh, to keep its value. And the idea is that nobody can hoard money. You have to keep money in circulation by putting stamps on. And, uh, you know, it was this effort in this little town of Virgil. Um, but as Pound says, all the slobs in Europe were terrified when they saw it because it meant the end of capitalist accumulation and the hoarding of money. In fact, it sort of meant the end of wealth as we've come to understand it. And certainly it meant the end of the banking industry. Um, so knew it was money, but pretended it was not in order to be on the safe side of the law. But in Russia, they bungled and did not apparently grasp the idea of work certificate and started the NEP with disaster and the immolation of men to machinery and the canal work and great mortality, which is as may be, and went in for dumping in order to trouble the waters in the usurers' helidice, all of which leads to the death cells, each in the name of its God. Or longevity, because as says Aristotle, philosophy is not for young men. Their katholu cannot be sufficiently derived from their hekasta. Katholu, he's now translating generalities, and hekasta, the particulars or the phalanx of particulars, as says Aristotle, philosophy is not for young men. Their katalu cannot be sufficiently derived from their hekasta, their generalities, cannot be born from a sufficient phalanx of particulars. Lord of his work and master of utterance, who turneth his word in its season and shapes it. Yao chose Shun to longevity, who sees the extremities and the opposites, holding true course between them, shielding men from their errors, cleaving to the good they had found, holding empires if not in a mortar with it, nor dazzled thereby, would have put the old man, son père, on his shoulders and gone off to some barren sea coast. Says the Japanese sentry, park your jeep over there. Some of the best soldiers we have, says the captain, tying Nippon Banzai from the Philippines, remembering Kagekiyo, how stiff the shaft of your neck is. And they went off each his own way. A better fencer than I was, said Kumasaka, a shade. 
I believe in the resurrection of Italy. Kia impossibile est four times to the song of Gassier, now in the mind indestructible. Ah, uh, Paul, let's come back um, to full screen and take a few moments here. Take a little breather that's, you know, we're still in the middle of Canto 74. This is one of the longer cantos. And, um, but I think, you know, absolutely critical to seeing how Pound's mind is working there, but how his mind is working is creating an entirely new way of composing. And it really is what Olson and Duncan were thinking of as one perception leads directly to the next, and there's nothing coming outside of his mind. I mean, you know, he's thinking of books, he's trying to think of the Chinese history and wisdom he's read, he's trying to think of the Greek mythologies, he's trying to figure out where he is, he's trying to remember the fragments of economic history he had, and at the same time, he's looking in the grass and seeing the little creatures down there in the grass. And he's listening to the sentries and the guards. And he's looking at his fellow inmates out there. Any thoughts, any questions, anybody? I see, CJ, your... maybe you're asking something. CJ, you're, you're muted, and we will hear you better if you can unmute. Thank you. My apologies. Um, why does he use abbreviations for something like asshole and all of the other cursing? Um, and you read it so clearly, and I'm going, well, why is, why is he... hoping the reader knows what this is. Um, everything is so straightforward in some horrible circumstances that have occurred. And so. Yeah, that's a really good question. I don't know. It's quite possible that his editor, James Laughlin at New Direction, was concerned that, you know, the book would be accused of obscenity. I mean, it, you know, we still hadn't had the Howell trial, which would be, you know, 48 to um, what, 58, it would be at 10 years before um, those words would go on trial and probably James Laughlin. Um, and and I, I just read them clearly because it's a little more awkward to read CSFM. And I just thought, you know, I've read it enough. That's, I hear it now, it's cocksuckers, motherfuckers, all of them. And, uh, you know, I think that's how anybody who reads it would hear, but I think, Probably he, you know, it was his publisher's decision. Um, just, uh, you know, I mean, again, this is this is something fairly new in poetry. We haven't gone through the beat revolution. We don't have, you know, the uh, trials around Howell, the trials around Lenore Candell's um, love book. Uh, we've had trials around Ulysses, but Ulysses doesn't even really use words like that for the most part. Ulysses has you know, maybe sexually explicit material going on, but this is this is something new to be putting into the poems there. I'm trying oh. to see when this is printed and um, why are we still doing that? <laughs> well, nobody went back and decided to, to change it. Okay. Just, yeah. He's still typing this up on uh, the field typewriter there uh, at the detention center. So a lot of that was probably in the manuscript and he was also using those manuscript shorthands to uh, not get his privileges revoked and whatnot. Oh, that's interesting thought. Yeah, that could very well be too. And then sure. he probably might've kept them in there just, I mean, cause he's doing a lot of that compression anyway. 
Yeah. No. Yeah. Talk to us about that compression, Andrew, because uh, it comes from the journals of John Adams, does it not? Some of those uh, WLD or CLD or these shortenings, which were passed on to people like Diane DePrima and others, these, these, uh, Barry McKinnon, another one who used these sort of shorthands and just left them in the poem. Yeah, well, you know, you're probably right, but I don't think John Adams invented it. I think, you know, in the world of handwriting, that was done quite a bit. And mm -hmm. if you um, just open a volume of, say, the letters of Pound Williams, they were both doing it. You know, it was like you're you're writing shorthand and then they just carried that over to the typewriter. And so it later becomes almost like a, a tick of habit, you know, post beat, you know, your is YR slash, um, that kind of thing that goes on. But I think that came to the sort of 50s and 60s poets out of reading both Pound and Williams. And Pound and Williams were, you know, getting it from various places, but the world of handwriting. So if you were reading letters, um, you were certainly seeing that because, um, you know, there is a certain kind of shorthand going there. Yeah, and medieval manuscripts, too. Uh, medieval manuscripts, too. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, if you look at old calligraphy, you know, very often um, you have these these sort of shorthands. But shorthand it was around in a lot of worlds. It was around in, um, you know, like uh, stenography, court stenography. Um, you know, so the shorthand was just, you know, I think in a way partly hangover from the world of handwritten things, but conveniently went right into the typewriter and, um, you know, is still being used at times by people, but I think most people don't think about that history of it. Um, one of the reasons also um, is, uh, you know, all of us live in a pretty affluent society, uh, so we can be very... Um, profligate with paper and even more with the electronic media. But there was an era where paper was expensive. And before paper, there were things like papyrus, vellum, which is sheepskin, um, uh, you know, the very, or, but even paper was costly and arduous to make. So in the interest of not wasting space, a lot of these kind of shorthands came up. So when Pound was reading the letters of Jefferson and Adams, um, you know, those two were following a long tradition of paper was a scant resource or writing surfaces, let's say, were a scant resource. So those kind of, you know, compressions. Yeah, Paul. Andrew, you said it may be the center of the book, the main thrust. Uh, I forget exactly how you worded it, but I don't know how humanity stands it. Can you elaborate on that? Well, you know, it's interesting. He says, with a painted paradise at the end of that, without a painted paradise at the end of that. And I think in a sense, what he's playing off of there is there's orthodox standard religion that says at the end of things, there's going to be this paradise. And we still have it today. You know, it's drawn in the most... Um, sentimental and, uh, you know, sort of impressionistic way. There's a paradise. But if you don't accept that, what do you have? At the end of it, there isn't a paradise. And Pound is at the point now where he knows that his life's work has been to write paradise. And what can he do? He's on death row. He's in a cage. And so when he says, I don't know how humanity stands it, that's also a reflection on his own state of mind. But I think it's the first time he's thought really deeply, what does it mean to have a paradise? And yet, if you accept the paradise, um, couldn't that just be a packet of lies, like a painted paradise at the end of something? So if you don't have a painted paradise, then what are you in for? And I think this is Pound's state of mind. And it's it's at that moment that, in some senses, paradise reveals itself to him as spezzato. It occurs in fragments. 
it's there and then it's not there. It's like an olive leaf in the air. One side glitters and the other is dull. It flashes back and forth. And I think what he's doing is he's coming to understand the paradise of the state of mind. And that, you know, to rigidify it as there's a painted paradise at the end of everything you do, or to deny it, how can you stand either of those two extremes? And throughout this canto, he's also talking about those old culture heroes of the Chinese, Yao and Shun, and they were always respected for not going to an extreme, but holding the middle. That's the Confucian teaching, the middle way, staying in the middle. So one extreme is there's a paradise at the end of it. It's a painted paradise, but there's one there. And the other is there's no painted paradise at the end of it. So instead, you know, I think he's working this out and we're able to watch his mind working it out. And this would be a huge change for him because I think he had an idea of what paradise was going to be and he could write 30 cantos of a paradise. And now he's discovering paradise is not at all what he thought. So to me, that becomes in a way that the core of it, and we're going to, um, oh, I think it's elsewhere in this particular canto or the next one where he brings back um, le paradis ne pas artificiel and then he says l'enfer no plus hell isn't either paradise is not in artificial hell isn't either and that's the state of mind that's the ability to look and say paradise is right here Hell is right here, right in front of me. A very Zen, a very Zen, co compatible with Zen, that kind of feeling. Yeah, I think, you know, maybe it's um, Guan Yin showing up and giving him a, you know, a, a Zen teaching. Guan Yin has now showed up twice in this canto, and she never showed up before when he had all his books around him. I feel like the lack of the books forced him into the moment, forced him into his, and, and the conditions he was in, it it focused his attention completely differently. Yeah, yeah, very, very differently. And the, I think one of the things for me that makes it so moving is to see him coming out of the books and into his state of mind and finding a mode of writing in which he seems absolutely fluid and almost like no agenda, no censorship. You know, the guards are talking. He's thinking his way through paradise. He's thinking about economics. He's seeing goddesses around him. Um, you know, just a great deal of material going on there. Andrew, do, do you think that um, he read Nietzsche on the value of forgetting um, monumental history, which was written, I guess, before this was um, that we, you know, I guess Nietzsche said that we have a tendency to valor to to kind of venerate um, ancient monumental history as something, you know, paradisiacal or great, um, thinking about Coleridge's Kubla Khan and then Rush's, you know, revisitation of the milk of paradise as being something in the past that we look to. And then now he's looking, you're saying, through these bars <laughs> at the present um, and having a different viewpoint about the past. Again, kind of Zen. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yeah, I doubt he read, I doubt he read Nietzsche. You know, I don't think he read much um non-economic oriented philosophy and but it's a little bit like he didn't read freud but i think he picked up you know a certain amount about what psychoanalysis was and even you know if you think that the early cantos seem to be blaming war on sex gone bad you know that sounds like freud at the time what is war? War is libido that's, you know, being repressed and coming out in these other ways. So so he's part of his time. So he could be 
sounding a lot like Nietzsche in ways without necessarily having to read Nietzsche. It would be, you know, conversations in the air in a way. Yeah, I have no idea if he had Nietzsche available to him. Yeah, the floatings of unconscious fascism in a way, both of whom were kind of influenced by similar ideas. Yeah, yeah. No poetry in my paradise, or I guess it all started with Plato on that score. Yeah, yeah. And he doesn't seem to think that much of Plato, though he does like uh, Aristotle, that philosophy is for old men, young men, or young people don't have a sufficient, you know, uh, phalanx of particulars to make generalities. Although Aristotle also said in Neomachian Ethics that you have to be beautiful and young and wealthy and smart in order to be happy. <laughs> which I guess implies you can't be a, an old man in a cage, at least. Yeah, yeah. Paul, can we go up to page 469, the end of this canto? Serenely in the crystal jet, as the bright ball that the fountain tosses, fair lane, as diamond clearness. How soft the wind under Taishan, where the sea is remembered. Out of hell, the pit. Out of the dust and glare, evil. Zephyrus, Apeliota. This liquid is certainly a property of the mind. Nec accidents est. But an element that neck accidents as means it's not a, it's not, it's not just an accident of the mind, but an element in the mind's makeup, as agens and functions, dust to a fountain pan. Otherwise, hast thou seen the rose in the steel dust, or swans down ever? So light is the urging. So ordered the dark petals of iron, we who have passed over Lethe. I think we all know what Lethe is, right? It's one of the rivers of Greek underworld. It's the river of forgetfulness. And I think that we who have passed over Lethe, he means everybody's passed over Lethe, and he's living in a world of forgetfulness. And now we'll move to the next page, Paul. The next canto, which also is quite radical in format. Music by Jeanequin, piece called Birdsong. But we have to start with another river in the underworld, Phlegethon, which is the river of fire. He's talking about we who passed over Lethe, but out of Phlegethon, the fire river, out of Phlegethon, Gerhard, art thou come forth out of Phlegethon? With books to Huda and Klagis in your satchel, with the Stendebuch of socks in your luggage, not of one bird, but of many. Um, Gerhard was a friend of Pound's who played music with Olga Rudge and Pounds have sponsored quite a few concerts with Gerhardt and Olga Rudge. And clearly when he was in the cage at Pisa, he did not have access to this musical score, but he knew he was going to put into it. And hang on to that line, not of one bird, but of many, because he's going to start seeing birds on phone wires looking like musical notes. Uh, and then here comes the score of John Akin's bird song, which uh, CJ had, I'm sorry, no, who was it? Was it okay. Diana, you're the one who came up with the music for that. Paul, you might see if you can retrieve that and post the little YouTube video because it's sort of interesting to get a little background of this musical piece and Gerhardt and Olga Rudge. But scroll down to the bottom of the musical piece and we'll look at one other really interesting thing he has done here. Uh, 
we can go to the bottom of the next page. Do you see right down at the bottom, the last thing besides the page number, are two little hieroglyphs that looks like a sideways dorji and something like an R. Those are old bone inscriptions from China um, that say, make new. We, um, one of the phrases associated with Ezra Pound is make it new or day by day, make it new. And we skipped over that because it really comes up in the Chinese cantos, but it's a call for renewal. And so just interesting to have this call of his in this canto to his old friend Gerhardt, out of Phlegathon, the river of fire, art thou come forth. And then almost like um, in such a pedestrian way with books to hew and clagas in your satchel, with a standard book of socks in your luggage. These are all sort of musicians in the satchel of Gerhardt, not of one bird, but of many, and the bird song of Janikin, and then closing off the canto with, you can see a date there, 28-9-33, Milano, and then make it new. Let's um, keep going, Paul. We'll go to the next page, Canto 76. And the sun high over horizon, hidden in cloud bank, lit saffron the cloud ridge, dove sta memora. This comes from Cavalcante. It means um, where memory liveth. It's an amazing line for Pound to pull out of a long, Canzoni by Cavalcanti, Dove sta memora, where memory dwells. Will, said the Signora Agresti, break his political but not economic system. But on the high cliff, Alcmini, Dryas, Hamadryas, Ak Heliades, flowered branch and sleeve moving, Dirce et Ijota, Ece Fuciamata Primavera in the timeless air, that they suddenly stand in my room here between me and the olive tree. I take this as, you know, actually happening to him. This is the dryads, the hamadryads, and the heliades, or the sun goddesses. Um, Dirce et Ichata, and the one who is called primavera, or spring, all these goddesses in the timeless air that they suddenly stand in my room here between me and the olive tree. Or nel plivo et al piedro on the slope at the sort of trihedral corner between me and the olive tree or on the slope by the trihedron and answered, the sun is in his great paraplum, leads in his fleet here. Sotto le nostre scogle, under our cliffs, under our craggy cliffs, a level their mast tops. Sigismundo by the Aurelia de Genova, by La Vecchia sotto San Pantaleone, Cunizza Caratredro e la Scalza, and she said, I still have the mold. And the rain fell all the night long at Ussel. Set Movaisa Veng blew over Tolosa, that rotten wind set Movaisa Veng. You can hear the malodorous blowing of the Veng, the Movaisa Veng blew over Tolosa. And in Mount Segur there was wind space and rain space. No more an altar to Mithras, from Il Triedro to the Castellaro the olives gray under gray holding walls, and their leaves turn under Sirocco. Vascalza, io so la luna, I am the moon, and they have broken my house. The huntress in broken plaster keeps watch no longer. Tempora, tempora, and as to mores, 
by Battle of Bologna and Wall, Memorat Jever, out of his bas relief, that line we recall him, and who's dead and who isn't, and will the world ever take up its course again? Very confidentially, I ask you, will it? With Dudonne dead and buried, not even Wall or Moukin or Voisin or the cake shops in the Nevsky. The Greif, yes, I suppose, and Schoeners and perhaps the Taverna and Robert's, but La Rupe no longer, La Rupe, Finito, Pre Catalan, Armenonville, Boulier, extinct as Willie, and there are, I suppose, no reprints. Tailfield bric a brac cocktoes bric a brac sea drift snow in them under, every man to his junk shop. House should have been built in the 80s or 60s for ah that. But Eileen's trick sunlight softens London's November. Progress? B H, your honor. Balls for your honor. Progress. La piglizia to know the ground and the dew, but to keep them three weeks. Chung, this is the middle way. Chung, the middle between the painted paradise and the no painted paradise. But to keep them three weeks. Chung, the middle, we doubt it. And in government, not to lie down on it. The word is made perfect. And that there is sincerity. Um, I can't use a pointer here, but if you see on the right-hand side, there's a figure. It's sort of a man with legs and an arm. And to the left is an open mouth with words coming up out of it. That's the Chinese word ideogram for sincerity, which Pound reads as a person standing by their word. Open mouth with words and a person standing by. Better gift can no man make to a nation than the sense of Kung Fu Tzu, Confucius, who was called Chung Ni, nor in historiography, nor in making anthologies. Let's see, I want to um, move now to um, page 478, Paul. We'll take a look at something a little further on here. About where those four dots in the middle of the page. Both eyes, the loss of, and to find someone who talked his own dialect. We talked of every boy and girl in the valley, but when he came back from leave, he was sad because he had been able to feel all the ribs of his cow. This wind out of Carrara, is soft as un tetzo cielo, the third sky, or really the third heaven or the third paradise. This wind out of Carrara is soft as un tetzo cielo, the third heaven, said the prefetto, as the cat walked the porch rail of Gardon, the lake flowing away from from that side. Keep an eye again on the cat showing up. I think when cats show up in this poem, we know we're, we're about to move into some kind of vision. As the cat walked the porch rail at Gardon, the lake flowing away from that side was still as is never in Sermio with Fujiyama above it. La Donna, said the prefect in the silence and the spring of their squeak doll is broken, and Bracken is out and the BBC can lie, but at least a different bilge will come out of it, at least for a little, as is its nature, can continue, that is, to lie as a lone ant from a broken ant hill, from the wreckage of Europe, ego scriptor, ego, Scriptor, I, the writer. This may be one of the most cited lines from the whole of the cantos. It's just two lines that show up there, but again, showing Pound's mind and mood. I can't imagine in the earlier cantos, 
he could have ever come up with a metaphor like this. Must must be something he actually down on his hands and knees saw, probably right outside of his cage, a lone ant from a broken ant hill, and then suddenly realized, that's me, ego scripter, I the writer from the wreckage of Europe as a lone ant from a broken anthill, from the wreckage of Europe, ego scriptor. It's quite a come down for a guy who thought he could write a poem that would stop war. The rain is falling, the wind coming down out of the mountain, Lucha, Forti, De Marmi, Bertold after the other one, parts reassembled, and within the crystal went up swift as Thetis, and color rose blue before sunset, and Carmen, and Amber, Spiriti Questi, Personae, tangibility by no means, Atasal, but the crystal can be weighed in the hand, formal, and passing within the sphere, Thetis, Maya. And that word there, uh, Aphrodite. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Thetis, Maya, Aphrodite. Can you sort of see that? The A and the PH and the R that looks like a P, Aphrodite, Thetis, Maya. Aphrodite, no overstroke, no dolphin fast, faster and moving, nor the flying azure of the winged fish under Zoagli when he comes out into the air, living arrow. And the clouds over the Pisan meadows are indubitably as fine as any to be seen from the peninsula. I, Barbaros, have not destroyed them as they have Sigismunda's temple. Divai Ishotai, and as to her effigy that was in Pisa, ladder and swing jump as for a crescent from the cross. Oh, white-chested Martin, God damn it! As no one else will carry a message. Say to la cara, amo. Just stop for a moment there. The way Pound, you know, moves, he's, through this, he suddenly sees, I think he just sees this white-chested Martin. He's looking at the bird. Oh, white-chested Martin, God damn it, as no one else will carry a message. Say to la cara, amo. And that may be Catullus he's thinking of. Catullus who said, I love and I hate. Amo, I love. Her bedposts are of sapphire. For this stone give us sleep. And in spite of Oi Barbaroi, the barbarians, Pervench, and a certain dwarf morning glory that knots in the grass, and a sort of buttercup at Sequelae, the paradis ne pas artificiel. States of mind are inexplicable to us. Paradise is not artificial. States of mind are inexplicable to us. And then these words mean something like weeping, weeping, weeping. El P gli honesti, gli honesti, the honest eyes. J'ai pitié des autres, I have had pity for others. Probablement as I say, but probably not enough. And at moments that suited my own convenience, the paradis ne pas artificiel. L'enfer non plus, hell is not either. There's a lot of languages in here. French, Greek, Italian, French again, more French, and yet look at the movement of this. Le paradis n'est pas artificiel, states of mind are inexplicable to us. Weeping, 
weeping, weeping, honest eyes. J'ai eu pitié des autres. I have had pity for others. Probablement pas assez. Probably not enough. And at moments that suited my own convenience. Le paradis n'est pas artificiel. L'enfer non plus. I think you can feel the pound moving from paradise to l'enfer, the inferno. In nine lines here. Came Eurus as comforter. And at sunset, La Pastorella de Sweeney, the um the herd the herder, the the herding girl of swine or pigs, the the you know, herder of pigs, came Eurus as comforter. And at sunset, La Pastorella de Sweeney, driving the pigs home. Benecomata Dea. The Benecomata Dea means fair tressed or fair haired goddess. I mean, this is his mind now. He can look out and see the little herding girl with her swines driving them home and sees her as a goddess from his cage. Under the two winged cloud, as of less than more than a day, by the soap smooth stone post where San Vio meets with your Canal Grande, between Salviati and the house that was of Don Carlos, should I chuck the lot into the water? Le bozze alume spiento. Le bozze means something like the proof sheets. He's suddenly remembering himself as a young man in Venice when he'd gotten, he was getting his first book published, Alume Spento, and looking at it, he must have fallen into despair and thought, this poetry is horrible. Should I chuck the lot into the tide water? He's by the canal grande between Salviati and the house that was of Don Carlos. Should I chuck the lot into the tide water? Le bozze, the proof sheets, Alume Spento. And by the column of Todero, should I shift to the other side or wait 24 hours? Free then, there in the difference, in the great ghetto left standing. I don't know what he means by free then, unless he's just thinking back to a time when he was a young man tormented by his poetry, but was free. Free then, there in the difference, in the great ghetto left standing with the new bridge of the era. Where was the old eyesore? Vendorman, Contarini, Fonda, Fonteco, and Tullio Romano carved the Silenes, as the old custom says, so that since then no one has been able to carve them. For the jewel box, Santa Maria de Miracole, de Grece, San Giorgio, the place of skulls in the pop cop Carpaccio. And in the font to the right as you enter are all the gold domes of San Marco. He's just thinking back to his early days, wandering around Italy, wandering around Venice here. And the font to the right as you enter are all the gold domes of San Marco. It's sort of an extraordinary image. You look in the fountain and you see all the gold domes of San Marco. Maybe that's an image of what he sees the mind as now. And now notice what happens here. Arachne che mi porta fortuna. Go spin on that tent rope. The arachne, of course, is the spider who brings me fortune. Che mi porta fortuna, who porta, portals, who brings me for, good fortune. Spider who brings me good fortune, go spin on that tent rope. Again, he's looking at the littlest creatures. These are the wild animals that give him power. The spider, Arachne, Jamie Porta Fortuna, go spin on that tent rope. Uncle George and Brasitalo's Abazzi avoid che passate per questa via. Does Danunzio live here? said the American lady, KH. 
I do not know, said the aged Veneziana. This lamp is for the Virgin. Non combattare, said Giovanna, meaning, don't work so hard. Arachne che mi porta fortuna, spider who brings me good fortune. Athena, who wrongs thee? And then Greek words that mean, who wrongs you? That butterfly has gone out through my smoke hole. It is companions here. Now it's the spider. Now it's the butterfly who goes out through his smoke hole. Uncle George observing. Corporal or whatever, Volpe's neck at the Lido, Lido and deducing his energy. Uncle G stood like a statue. Rutherford Hayes on a monument as the princess approached him. You from New England, Bark the 10th district. They came over me as he talked. This is Daphne, Sandro. How, after 30 years? Tomaso Gregorio Vio. Don't let him get you, bird the bearded dottore. That's a doctor. When was the Scotch kirk in Venice to warn one against Babylonian intrigue? And there have been since then very high Episcopal vagaries. Well, my window looked out on the square where Ognisanti meets San Trovaso. Things have ends and beginnings. And the gilded Cassani neither then nor up to the present. The hidden nest. The hidden nest is Olga Regge's little apartment down a teeny narrow little alley where Pound used to go visit her. And the gilded Cassoni neither then nor up to the present, the hidden nest. Tommy's dream, the great Ovid bound in thick boards, the bas-relief of Ishota, and the care and contriving Olim de Malatestas, the long hall over the arches at Fano, Olim de Malatestas. 64 countries and down a boiling volcano, says the sergeant, ex-rum runner, the rum being Vino Rosso. Run whiskey, says he. Mountain oysters. Listiate con lagrime. Bottled with tears. Politus lacrime. Elegant tears. Bricks thought into being ex nihil. Suave in the cavity of the rock. La concha right through the middle. That butterfly has gone out through my smoke hole. Saeva gets buff the rose for the background to Leonella. Petrus Pisani thinks it that a cameo should remain, that a cameo should remain. In Arezzo, an altar fragment, Cortona Angelico, Poeri de Aguilí, Poeri a diaoli sent to the slaughter, necked, gig and necked, slave against slave, necked, gig and necked, to the sound of the bum drum, to eat remnants for a usurer's holiday, to change the price of currency, metathemenon, woe to them that conquer with armies, and whose only right is their power. Well, let's come back to full screen, Paul. In some ways, there's a lot of things I don't know in this canto, names, places, even little sayings, but I think you can feel the mood of the memory and the thinking about the world and um, the moments where it's as though a different insider voice comes over him where you suddenly feel he's channeling Confucius or something and that very, you know, stark ending, woe to them that conquer with armies and whose only right is their power. Yeah, Paul. We've talked before about uh, going fear of abstractions and other uh, suggestions by Pound from ABC of Writing. And then in that segment that uh, 
we were looking at, and if I may share screen again to go over the specifics, it seems to me that when he's getting into a more rhetorical bent, that's when he often uses a, a language other than English, so that it's kind of a way to um, mute the fact that he's he's going rhetorical on us. Is that you, you see uh -huh. that? <laughs> Well, maybe, you know, I, I take this stanza, though, um, as nine lines where he travels from paradise to hell, um, because I, I think you're right that these, some of these languages can be defensive. But when he says, pitié des autres, I have had pity on others, probably not enough. And at moments that suited my own convenience. You know, this is a man on death row. I think he's really tallying up his soul. And it's then that he realizes he's just moved from paradise into hell. And remember, he's lived in Paris. He's lived in Italy. Um, I don't think his Greek is very good, but he's got a lot of it in his head. But I think this is a man who, in a way, is, um, you know, multilingual by this point. Um, and I think he's quite at ease moving back and forth between languages and whether, you know, I mean, I understand what you're saying. This could be rhetorical, but I also take it as um, an acute reflex in which he looks at himself and realizes his own egotism and his own um, inability to care for others at times. You know, I have taken pity on others probably not enough, and at moments it suited my own convenience. I mean, it's not until Allen Ginsberg that we get that kind of candor coming from an American poet, I think. I wonder if he used the English if he felt it would have sounded too confessional, and I don't mean confessional poetry necessarily because that came after the cantos, but he was trying to hedge his bets, trying to stick with his program of, you know, using the image but in here communicating something with rhetoric in a way of kind of adding some surprise or bunting that that's that's the thing that goes through my mind when i hear these abstractions yeah. it seems like if you put it in english it would sound it would it would sound less i i think you know mm -hmm. i don't know mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. but then it's remarkable that the next moment he looks out on the street and he says sees a little girl you know herding her swine home at the end of the day and she came Eurus as comforter and at sunset, La Pastorella de Sweeney, driving the pigs home. Bene comata dea, you know, um, beautiful hair of the goddess or, you know, beautiful tress goddess under the two wing cloud as of less and more than a day. Um, I, t I think Pound is also really, you know, in a remarkably vulnerable stage here. And in this vulnerability, his he thinks in multiple languages. I mean, I think this is what probably got him confined to St. Elizabeth's. You know, he probably talked like this to the psychologists who were, um, you know, later on interviewing him. And he couldn't stay in one language. You know, he... He, he is no man. He really doesn't know who he is. is. Is his language English? Is he American? He's been living in Italy for decades. He's been reading books for decades. He's been studying Chinese. And now he's sort of reduced to where his companions are a swine girl who goes, swine herding girl who goes by, a butterfly, a spider, an ant on a battered anthill. I mean, you know, I think there's a you know, like almost a mental breakdown that allows something else to come through. So when you even use the word term method, you know, I don't think he's got a method here. I think his method came before Canto 74. Hmm. Uh, Andrew, do you well, think that, that Rimbaud had already written Je suis, Je suis, at, Je suis un autre, um, when, when I saw J'ai uh, pitié des autres, um, I, I first saw that and I thought, well, maybe following up on Paul's comment, sorry about my dog, um, that um, his multilingual 
what you call kind of maybe potential defensive language as a guy from Idaho who's trying to wrap in some more, you know, down home idiomatic phrases, but at the same time talk to the learned poets. Um, in his secret language, I mean, you know, Kenneth Koch said poetry is another language. Um, Plath made it, you know, metaphor as a different language. He's using literal different languages, creating um, a global kind of ideogram, a communication as an asterisk to multiple places and peoples maybe, but um, it does seem um, like he is othering himself a lot. And and I actually really respect, I mean, can you imagine being in a cage subject to the elements and still drawing on these languages and these, and these, and these knowledges rather than just reverting to the sensory, the, the embodied experience that he's having. Not that wow. that would have been a bad thing, but I'm wondering if he is, he's so wedded to his legacy still that he's just got to be consistent with, um, you know. Well, later in the cantos, he has a remarkable line. He says, it can't all be done in one language. Oh. And you could take that as poetry, scholarship, world peace, or his own mind can't do it in one language. It can't all be done in one language. And that's what I feel when I read these. He can't talk in one language at this point. Or let's say he can't say what he needs to say in one language. He needs multiple languages here in order to say what he needs to say. In order to be true to it, in order to not have it be the painted image at the end, so to speak. Right. Yeah. And then to think of like, who is he writing for? He thinks he could be hung any day. So if he sees the cow, the, the herd, the herding girl of pigs, the pastorella, he may as well speak to her in her own language. You know, this could be the last person he'll see for all he knows. You know, when he calls a spider a rock I think he's actually having a vision. You know, it's not just, you know, this is not just like, some old spider, he's not going to whack the spider. He sees the spider who's the weaver of webs and fate, like the fates themselves. And, you know, his fate is in that spider web. You know, there's nowhere else for him to turn for his fate. So she is a rock me. She may be just an ordinary spider, but she is a rock me. Well, and then in, later in what Canto, is it 80? The one where it's kind of a elaborate almost ritual where he's almost calling out the gods and goddesses each in their own name as he keeps repeating yeah. uh and uh he sees all the things in the natural world as emanations of the uh of the spiritual world yeah calling mm -hmm. it all up to arms and so to speak in that poem yeah, I think that's, you know, that's what's happening. He's, but he's got such a wealth of knowledge that he uses all these different languages to call the names. So, but I think he really, I think he's really seeing things here. I mean, you know, that lone ant on the broken anthill is ego scripter. It is I, the writer. And that spider is Arachne weaving his fate. And that Pastorella de Sweeney, the, um, girl who herds the pigs is a goddess for him. I mean, he must be in this sort of, you know, beatific state. And yet at the same time, it's both hell as much as paradise. I, I also think that writing in Italian is more beautiful than some of the English language, which is more abrupt and it doesn't flow. The Italian flows, so it's about sound of the whole process and his ability to slip between languages is is brilliant and i you know i, I the, all of the minutia that a poet writes about the yeah. lady did the spider the, the web around the rope the all of those little things um make it i'm right there with him yeah, yeah. Do we know yeah, if bring, him, Robert bring her? Oh, sorry. Go ahead, Amber. Yeah, I was just going to say, I think I think to him, words are now becoming um, 
you know, objects in a way, natural objects. So even if it sounds like he's being abstract, he's putting down words, you know, like Snyder said so memorably, like rip rap on the trail, put these words down before your mind, like rip rap on the trail. And I think Pound is putting these words down and they may sound abstract, they may sound foreign, but I think he's cobbling them in like real items. You know, he's not in a world of sort of, I'm going to tell you about Sigismundo Malatesta, or I'm going to pronounce on economics. He's just phrases and words are appearing to him and he's putting them like into like a great mosaic in a way. Uh, Diana, you were going to say something. Well, I was, I've been reading uh, Robert Bringhurst, The Ridge, and um, I had read it, uh, part of it before, and I delved back into it since I've been in this class just uh, yesterday and today, and I felt, uh, I thought there was definitely in, um, so I'm referring right now to the earlier poems in uh, Bringhurst's book, The Ridge, which are the language poems, he calls them. And it feels like he's touching on the same concept of thinking about meaning differently and that somehow that's what Pound's doing too. And because Bringhurst is, is right, he's saying you need to, a, a language is a reflection of a place and a culture. It's woven into it. You can't separate it. And he speculates that maybe it's even woven into our you know, our genetic makeup in a way that we don't even understand. And how can you know how a horse talks because you don't speak horse? Um, but I, but it seems like, it feels like Pound is looking for more to bring to the party than has been brought before. That he he may not be totally fluent in these languages, but he gets a good sense of there is a whole way, other way of understanding things. And we're not talking about any of that. So anyway, that's. I wonder, I wonder too, uh, if it's not so much that he's looking for it, but that because of the state he's in, where, you know, our, our usual state is kind of dissolved. And so these things are coming in that are, they are part of him. The languages are part of him. He's fluent in them. Um, what am I trying to say? But yeah, he, he's in some kind of expanded state, I think, as Andrew was saying. Mm -hmm. And so what flows in is a lot different in that kind of state than it is, you know, when you're, you know, when your next meal is coming from. And so interesting that he's got nobody to talk to. And I think, you know, these He's, you know, the butterfly, the arachne, the Katie did, the, the lone ant, you know, these are now, these are now his companions. And I really think they've become the animal powers. And it seems that every time he sees one, um, he, he has a new understanding. I mean, I find so powerful that sense of the lone ant from a battered ant hill from the wreckage of Europe ego scriptor i am the writer it's like there he is knowing he's just like a lone ant on a you know he's probably seen a jeep just you know unwittingly drive across an anthill and one last ant is scrambling around or waving its antenna in panic and confusion around you know the the wreckage and you know so he's starting to see these things the fact that he sees the katie did and first sees it and then sees its color and then sees it's missing a wing. Um, you know, and I put all these things together with, you know, that, that French of I've had pity on others, probably not enough. And at times, you know, that were for my own convenience. And then he immediately sees, you know, Paradise isn't an artificial, hell isn't either. And, you know, he's clearly in a hell of remorse, regret. So who is the reoccurring cat? Camp Kitty. Well, the cat <laughs> that is always walking on that rail at the Gardon, we don't really know except that it's a cat he encountered and it shows up time and again in the cantos. It seems to have been on a railing maybe over the lake where he was looking at the villa of Catalas, 
but what strikes him is not the villa of Catullus, this great historic poetry place, but somehow the cat. And I think it becomes, in a way, you know, Dionysus. That you know, it's like this. It's it's a symbol of from the other world. It's a symbol of the supernatural power of Dionysus, and um, just like you know, so I think he. I, I think it's I think it's a cat that appears in his mind, and that's the cat. For, for whatever reason, we have no idea, but it's the cat that appears in his mind. And later on, there's that uh, all the everything's turning into lynxes. Lynxes, yeah, yeah, Every, yeah, yeah. We'll get to that. The great, you know, chorus of uh, "Oh, lynx, oh, lynx, oh, lynx." Yeah, and. In some ways, I think it's that cat, but whatever it is, it's a supernatural power. It's the cats. Or as he says, you know, where we'll get to it later, but when cats appear, nothing is going to happen. Nothing that is that is visible to the guards. Mm -hmm. So to him, the cat is like, you know, the messenger saying, something divine is going to happen, but the guards aren't going to be able to see it. Well, I suggest we break here. We'll pick up in two weeks and read forward if you want to, but I think we'll just pick up and keep going, you know, um, more or less from where we have ended here, which is page 483. We'll pick up with 484 and move forward.